Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host. All right, welcome back to the show. This is episode 236, and I'm your host, Brother Adam Thayer. Brother Robert is in Pennsylvania this week with the Masonic Roundtable, so I'll be filling in today. We have a couple of excellent papers this week, so without any further delay, let's get into our first paper on a subject very near to my heart. The Seven Greatest Mistakes of Freemasonry by Author Unknown Number 1. Ritual Without Meaning Too many times we are more concerned about performing the ritual perfectly without understanding what it means. Ritual for the sake of tradition is worthless. Ritual for the sake of enlightenment is valuable. An understanding of the ritual's meaning is far more important than just memorizing it. Number 2. Fellowship Without Frivolity Whenever Masons decide to hold a function for fellowship, a discussion typically ensues about how to make the function have the smallest impact on the lodge's finances and the wallets of the members. This results in paper plates, meager meals, boring and less well-attended events. To spend money wisely in order to make fellowship a grand time is wise for the lodge that wants to be successful. Also, we do not have to be slaves to form, endlessly repeating the same toasts and replies. We should reward individuality and creativity in order to keep our meetings alive and fun. Number three, quantity without quality. A lodge with seven great men that believe in the Masonic ideals and actively strive to improve themselves and therefore the lodge is far better off than a lodge with 100 men that show up to lodge just to be seen. Number four, education without philosophy. Many times we think of Masonic education as being a lesson on the local lodge's history, a famous Mason, the history of the worldwide fraternity, or how to do ritual properly. But if no philosophy is covered in Masonic education, then little self-improvement is accomplished. Discussing Masonic lessons in terms of philosophy, ideas, and a man's conduct is what truly transform men into Masons. It is important to share and discuss topics that are foreign to a lodge's membership, and it is sometimes even necessary to challenge our preconceived ideologies through Masonic education. Number five, charity without connection. Big charities often require that fundraisers be conducted and large checks written to the people that actually perform the charity. This type of charity offers no self-improvement because it has no real connection to us or our lives. If we extend our hands to our needed brethren, and devote our own skills and time to their problems, then we are engaging in true, meaningful charity. Number six, frugality without discretion. Frugality is not a tenet of Freemasonry, a cardinal virtue, or a landmark. It is acceptable for the Lodge to spend its funds on worthwhile activities that will enhance the Masonic experience of its brethren. Not everything should be done in the cheapest way, a habit to which we have become accustomed. Number seven, leadership without competence. A man does not deserve to be master of the lodge solely because he has spent a certain amount of years attending meetings or because he is next in line. We, on occasion, elect our leaders without any regard for the skills that they possess in order to function in that capacity. We should only elect competent and qualified men to preside over us. I hope you were able to pick up a few ideas from that. I know personally I've seen ritual without understanding happen too often in our lodges and it not only deprives the brothers of the meaning, but also the new initiates that we're trying to reach. One of the episodes in the old Power Gang series tells the tale of the young, cowlick beheaded alfalfa attempting to shed his reputation as a common crooner and become a great opera star. He visits an opera company where the impresario is so inspired, he immediately signs Alfalfa to a contract effective 20 years hence. At the appointed time, two decades later, the intrepid Devo makes his operatic debut and the audience, predictably, boos him off the stage. It's all downhill from there for our hero, whose adult life just doesn't turn out the way he expected. The episode ends happily as Alfalfa wakes from his dream, sees the error of his ways, and returns to his calling as a popular, albeit off-key, crooner. 
In many ways, the episode is a foreshadowing of the real life of the actor Carl Alfalfa Schweitzer, whose meteoric rise to fame as a child preceded a tragic adulthood. Hal Roach created the R Gang comedies in 1921 after watching a group of kids do what kids do best. They were playing in his yard. Originally made as silent films, the series grew in popularity as Roach added sound in the 1930s. MGM re-released the episodes in the mid-1950s as The Little Rascals. In 1935, Carl's parents took him and his older brother Harold to visit the How Roach Studios in Los Angeles. The purpose of the trip was nothing less than to turn Carl and Harold into child stars. And it worked. Carl and Harold parked themselves in front of the crowd at the studio's cafe and began performing. Roach saw them and signed them on the spot. Carl, Alfalfa, as he was known in the series, quickly overshadowed Harold and became one of the top stars along with regulars Darla Hood and George Spanky McFarland. He was enormously popular with viewers, but just as unpopular with the child actors and filming crew. Alfalfa was a prankster and the biggest bully of the gang. During filming, he would intentionally step on other kids' feet or stick them with a nail he carried in his pocket. On one occasion, a cameraman became frustrated with Carl as he muffed his lines and told him, get it right so we can go to lunch. After the cameraman left, Alfalfa gave each of the kids a stick of gum and collected it back from them after they were done chewing it. Then, he took the enormous wad and stuck it into the gears of the camera. That afternoon, the kids went home while the cameraman tried to save his machine. One day, director George Sidney became so frustrated with Alfalfa's antics, he pulled him aside and told him, Come and see me when you grow up so I can beat the crap out of you. In 1940, Roach booted 13-year-old Alfalfa from the series for being too old. He had been earning about $750 a week, a fortune in the Depression era, and supporting his family. Suddenly, it all ended and like most child stars, he did not make a successful transition into acting as an adult. While continuing to struggle in his acting career, he became an outdoorsman and hunting guide. In 1958, he borrowed a hunting dog from a man named Bud Stilts. He lost the dog when it ran after a bear on a hunting trip and he offered a reward for the dog's return. When a man brought the dog back to him, Alfalfa was so grateful he paid the reward and bought the man several drinks. Later, he decided Stilts should be responsible for the money he spent on the dog's return. On January 21, 1959, Carl went to see him and demanded $50. Stilts refused to pay. They argued and fought. Finally, Alfalfa drew a knife and went after him. Stilts ran, got a gun, and killed the 31-year-old former child star. A jury subsequently acquitted Stilts of any wrongdoing. Along the way, there was a bright spot in Carl's short and tragic life. In his work as a hunting guide, he crossed paths with cowboy superstar Roy Rogers a 33rd degree mason and member of Hollywood Lodge 355. Roy tried to help Carl's faltering career by giving him parts in several of his shows. He also encouraged Carl to join the Freemasons, which he did. Brother Carl was buried in Hollywood's Forever Cemetery, a resting place for many of Hollywood's greatest. His tombstone bears symbols of the better parts of his otherwise tough life. It reads, Carl Alfalfa Schweitzer, and is adorned by a carving of a hunting dog, not Pete from the R Gang series as some think, and two square and compasses flank the top. Interestingly, 
The cemetery sits on the grounds of what once was Southland Lodge 617, and the original lodge building is still standing. Alfalfa and other child actors from the series proved being a child star wasn't as glamorous as it might have seemed. About half of them, Carl included, did not live to see 40. Even Carl's brother Harold committed suicide at age 42. Today, the little rascals are all gone, every one of them. Many, Carl chief among them, never had that second chance Alfalfa got when he woke from his operatic nightmare. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. Now up next, I have the pleasure of reading a piece from one of my favorite Masonic authors. The Fraternity Needs a Lighthouse by Worshipful Brother Bill Hosler. Recently, I saw a photo of a lighthouse being hit with a giant tidal wave. Mother Nature hit this edifice with everything she had, and it not only withstood the force of the wave, but the lighthouse continued to stand, and its beacon still shining its light to the world. Lighthouses are designed to warn ships of upcoming dangers, coral reefs, shoals, shallow water, and harbor entrances. Anything that may cause a vessel to sink, incur damage, or cause loss of life. Their light shines in order to make navigating the seas a better, safer place. When constructing a lighthouse, the builder would pick a solid, level area in which to lay a solid foundation using only the finest materials available to him in that area. Upon the foundation, the more modern lighthouses were built using rocks or stones cemented together into one majestic edifice which, if properly maintained, can withstand the elements and continue to be at the benefit of man for an eternity. I would like to think our gentle craft is much like that lighthouse. Our fraternity was built upon a solid foundation of faith, hope, and charity. Each stone of that lighthouse is emblematic of the brethren which comprise the membership of our craft. Each one of us were once rough stones which, much like the Temple of King Solomon, were chiseled and shaped by the builder with the working tools of masons, until those stones, like us, were hewed, squared, and leveled to the builder's requirements. These stones are united into one common mass and strengthened by the spreading of cement, which, when hardened, allowed the builder to complete this collection of individual stones into a structure which produces light, and which, when used properly, can help us ward off all approaching danger and become a benefit to mankind for the ages to come. The world will never know how many people throughout history were saved from an early watery grave because the light from those lighthouses alerted the crews of those vessels and kept them on a safe path to their final destination. Much like we will never know how many men have been saved from a life of disrepute and dishonor because they were taught and learn to apply the teachings of our humble craft to their life and use the light of Freemasonry to help them subdue their passions. Any man-made structure requires constant maintenance to ensure its long-term service. Preservationists must continue to inspect and repair parts of the building which have begun to weaken or fall apart. The light source, which is the reason for the building's existence, must also be constantly maintained, or the source replaced and perhaps upgraded to ensure the lighthouse's relevance. If the lighthouse no longer produces light, chances are the edifice would be abandoned and the entire building would begin to crumble and eventually cease to exist. Many people contend Freemasonry has begun to follow down the path of that neglected lighthouse. In our zeal for greatness in numbers, we have ceased to continue to maintain or upgrade our light source. Dues which no longer cover the costs of running our lodges and the living stones have begun to crumble away. The cement which should merge us into one sacred band of friends and brothers has begun to crack as our meetings, which were once a source of enlightenment and friendship, have degraded into two-hour-long arguments over the costs of basic supplies like toilet paper and light bulbs, like pieces of dried mortar. Our members drop away, never to be seen again. Even when the brethren want to maintain their symbolic lighthouse, many times they aren't allowed to even try because of building codes of a faraway Grand Lodge who micromanage and oversee everything. Many common and sensible solutions cannot be applied to fix their lighthouse because of the over-regulations of Grand Lodges, and when the workers ask the reason for the rule, they are told it's because we've always done it that way. All the while the stones have begun to fall away from our lighthouse and sadly can't be replaced. 
these poor workmen have to stand by and watch in frustration as their beloved structure falls apart. The light source itself may also dim from lack of maintenance. A century ago, the light was produced by a single source, provided by a candle or a lamp, which was reflected into a large lens, and then it was magnified and could be seen for miles. Think about that. One spark from a small candle or lamp could provide life-saving light for miles away. What if the fuel source for that light wasn't replenished on a regular basis? Without the fuel, there is no light, and the entire shore would be cast into darkness. And sadly, vessels approaching the perils of the shore would not receive warning, and their passengers would perish. Sadly, in the last half century, our lodges have not been replacing the fuel of Masonic light, allowing many of the followers of King Solomon to be cast into darkness. Lodge meetings have become a place to discuss fundraisers to supplement the deficit and the lodge treasury, which unrealistically low dues and charity events, which will eventually get the lodge's name in the local newspaper in hopes of bringing more men to the door of the lodge. The source of light, being Masonic education and charity, have been extinguished in order to try and bring in new members. The light of masonry has been dimmed in our lodges because in the last half century, our fraternity has chosen bureaucracy and membership numbers over Masonic education and Masonic charity. When the light of a lighthouse has been dimmed due to circumstances like fog, the keeper will turn on a foghorn. A foghorn is a device which emits a loud sound to warn vessels when the lighthouse is too dim to be seen. A loud cry in the darkness to warn others in order that they may ward off all approaching danger. I hope this paper will be seen as a foghorn which warns others of the dangers of a dimmed light source. The grand edifice of Freemasonry may be in a state of disrepair, but it is far from being to the point where it needs to be torn down. Our foundation is as solid and level as it was when it was first laid. We must begin to repair what time and neglect have done to our lighthouse, using quality materials and upgrade all operation systems to ensure we can withstand whatever is being thrown at us and to keep our light source shining for centuries to come. All right, I hope you guys got as much from that piece as I did. If you enjoy Brother Bill's writing, you can read him and many other of today's top Masonic writers on the Midnight Freemasons, publishing three new articles every week. Be sure to check out the Masonic Roundtable live on Tuesday nights at 10, 9 central on YouTube. And check out our sponsors who are available in the show notes. Robert will be back next week. Thanks for spending this time with me today, and I look forward to hearing from all of you soon. From whence came you, I'm Adam Thayer. to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Be sure to join us for our next edition.